Hi folks. In booktube terms, every month of the year has a theme. Last month it was February Fantasy, this month it's March Mystery Madness, and there's also another theme for March, which is March of the Mammoths. Uh, I don't normally do these themes, but one just kind of coincided with my reading habits this month. I have read a mammoth, and we will talk about that shortly. A mammoth, in booktube terms, means any book over 800 pages in length. So, I'm not a big fan of big books, but I have read a few, and I thought we would talk about the ones that I have read. Uh, I'm on Goodreads, so I'm able to actually list all the books that I've read uh, in order of page count, which is very handy. Um, so what's, what's the longest book that I have ever read? It's this one, and I've got it as a physical book for once. <laughs> oh, oh, it's a little hot, you know, it's very hard for me to hold a book like this. Just kidding, folks. Don't get all bent out of shape now, okay, if you're a, if you're a Christian. Uh, look, proof that I've read the whole darn thing. Look at that dirty mark on the spine. This is the uh, New Living Translation of the Holy Bible, which is a good one because it is, in, to some extent, a transliteration, which I think that's the right term, whereas it's not trying to do a direct word-for-word -word translation. Uh, it's trying to capture the meaning of a sentence in more in more conventional English uh, because things don't always translate well word for word uh, from languages like Hebrew or Greek straight to English. So it makes the historical parts of the Bible much more readable and you don't lose out on any clarity. I did think it was weird that dollars were mentioned instead of like shekels. <laughs> you know, it's like that's a kind of a weird choice because like the value of the dollar is going to fluctuate uh, wildly. So I think they should have just left that alone. But anyway, and books that are more theological in nature, like the things written by Paul, uh, they're probably better read in something like the New International Version or the New King James Version, New American Standard Version, whatever. But this definitely made getting through the Bible a lot easier than it would have been. Uh, so I'm one of the few people who's read the whole Bible. Shame on you Christians who haven't. It's supposed to be the most inspiring book that exists, right? Inspired by the Holy Spirit. Why haven't you read it? Very telling, right? So we're not going to talk about, about the Bible. We're just going to have a quick skim through the various large mammoth books that I have read. So the next one, so the Bible clocks in at 2,057 pages, according to the edition on uh, Goodreads. I've, I've, where possible, I have put these as paperbacks, so that it's all consistent, because hardcover novels uh, tend to have fewer pages because it's larger, larger size of book, in terms of, you know, physical size like that. So the next one actually is a graphic novel. I have read Why the Last Man. Now I did read these as individual comics, but I just notched it up as the omnibus edition on Goodreads because it's the same thing as the comics really. I didn't realize how large it was until I looked at this. It's 14,040 pages long. It was a really good graphic novel. TV series that came out recently on Disney Plus, not so good. Couldn't stand more than three episodes of it. Um, yeah. And the whole wokeness thing, I'm not on board with that. Sorry if you are, I'm not. Uh, I'm tired of my entertainment being heavily politicized in a way that's trying to sort of control the minds of people almost by sort of almost subliminally getting you to think in certain ways. I'm just tired of it. Um, so The Last Man, the graphic novel, is really well worth reading, um, and it's the exploration of what would happen if uh, all the men on the planet, all the males of every species, just died. Just died, just like that. Only the women survived. Except, mysteriously, this one man and his pet monkey, who is also a uh, male. So it's all about the travels of this man and the women he encounters and how women try to put civilization back together without men. Uh, 
Bear in mind, it was written before all this woke culture business took off, right? And that's why it's interesting, and that's why it doesn't work when you try to reconstruct it in the modern day. Uh-huh. <laughs> right? Why the last man? The next one, and this will come as no surprise, in fact, the next few will come as no surprise, uh, it's a Stephen King book. It's The Stand, of course. Uh, coming in at 1,348 pages, big apoc apocalyptic novel about Captain Trips, this superflu virus that gets out of a military base, destroys the world, aside from a handful of uh, mysteriously uninfected people who don't catch it, and then it's all about people dividing into two camps. Uh, the good, essentially it's the good people and the evil people, which kind of grates on me because you know what, everybody's kind of a mixture. Uh, and there's a big battle between good and evil. Well, it's not really a big battle between good and evil, it kind of hints that there's going to be, and it never really quite, I don't know, I don't want to say too much about The Stand. You probably know the story, there's been a mini-series in the 1990s, a recent adaptation, and the book has been out a long time. I do remember the day I bought the book. You know, back in the pre-internet era when you didn't get a warning about books, you would just go into your bookshop and you'd see something unexpected on the shelf and you'd go, oh! well, there was this one day my family and I were in 1990. Uh, or, now, the stand had been out before 1990. I think it was out in the late 70s. But it was a, a cut version. And nobody knew it was a cut version, at least I didn't, uh, because there was nothing to compare it to. So it was like six or 700 pages. Uh, it's one I hadn't read, but there I was, uh, we were stopping over in this town on the way to the caravan site, me and my family, and I went into this uh, bookshop, and there in front of me was The Stand, hard, new hardcover, the complete and uncut edition, and it was like gigantic, uh, and my eyes were like, oh, you know, and of course I handed over the 15 pounds immediately, which is a lot of money for somebody who was young. Uh, in 1990, you know, I haven't had a job yet. I was still in, still in college. And, uh, of course, when I got to the caravan site, I just dove straight into that. Forget about going for walks on the beach and everything. It was just the stand. It's very hard to get that kind of enthusiasm now for books that you had when you were very young, you know. I uh, kind of wish I could recapture that. But nothing excites the way it does when you've got less life experience. So the stand, yeah. Uh, I don't know that I would enjoy it the same if I read it today. I did not really enjoy the new TV series that came out, uh, although I'm in good company when I say that. It seems to have been fairly poorly received in the ratings. Um, but the thing that grates on me is the very uh, overt Christianization. What's the word I'm looking for? Christianization? No, it's not right. I mean, it's a very Christian book in the sense that, you know, the Christian God is very much in the background of the stand. Uh, and Randall Flagg, the, the, the walking dude, the bad guy, uh, he, he very much is, is the devil, essentially. You know, although he's not named as the devil. But it's definitely the Christian God. You know, no other God, it's the Christian God. And that bothers me, really. Um, I think Stephen King over the years has changed his mind somewhat about the sort of background metaphysics that he puts in his books. If you've ever read Revival, uh, he takes a very, it's a very different take on Christianity in that book than in The Stand. That's a really good book, by the way. There's a part of it called The Terrible Sermon that, wow, you really got to read that. Um, anyway, let's move on. We've talked about The Stand for enough. The next one, and I didn't realize this was like just under the page count of The Stand, clocking in at 1,249 pages. It is Under the Dome by Stephen King. I really like this one. I like the premise of it, being stuck under this, a whole town stuck under this mysterious dome. Nobody can get in or out. Um, but I often kind of thought, did nobody really try digging down far enough? Like how, you, you could if you really wanted to dig down 50 feet. You know, you know, and then try to get in that way. No, it doesn't seem like they throw missiles at the thing and doesn't doesn't work. Uh, but yeah, I really like this book. I watched the whole TV series. If you've watched the TV series and you thought, hmm, read the book anyway. The book goes in a different direction. 
the TV series gets into weird territory that has nothing whatsoever to do with the book. The book is way better. I say that though, and my friend Andrew, who has read more Stephen King than I have, he couldn't finish it, which was odd to me. Um, and it's, it's one that he bought even, but he couldn't finish it. Whereas I thought, I just devoured it. it I read it in no time. Uh, yeah, one of Stephen King's better books, I think, Under the Dome. The next one, clocking in at 1,181 pages, is It. And I read it as a teenager. It was one of the first Stephen King books that I read. I think the very first one was Night Shift. But I read it when I was about 15. And I just absolutely loved it. It was a magical experience. I didn't want it to end. I have reread it. Yeah, I've actually reread. I've reread a mammoth uh, in much later life, and I did not like it anywhere near as much because it was kind of a you know, I didn't mind the magical elements of the book so much as a younger reader, but I kind of did mind it as an older reader. And it just didn't pack the same sense of magic that it did when I was young. Uh, yeah, I've seen the, the, the recent movies. I kind of like them. Part 2, not so much. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it still does stand out in my head as a, as, a, as a pretty good book. Pennywise, though, Pennywise the Clown as the villain... It doesn't really do it for me, i got to say. I don't know if you're scared of clowns, maybe it does for you, but it just didn't really do it for me. Um, one of the best scenes, really, is the opening scene with the little boy and the boat uh, on the street. Yeah. So, the next one, and again, I didn't realise this was so big because I originally read it in hardcover with smaller page count. It's the fourth volume of the Dark Tower saga called Wizard and Glass. Uh, clocking in at 1,041 pages. Um, I'm a big fan of Dark Tower Saga. I've read the first volume about three times. I don't know why, but I keep coming back to it. The Gunslinger, it was called. I've only ever read up to volume four. So I have five, six, and seven, plus the standalone novel, The Wind Through the Keyhole or something it's called. I've got those to read. I do want to read them at some point because I'm heavily invested in that particular fantasy series, even though I'm not really a fan of fantasy so much. But the Dark Tower works for me. And then there's Four Past Midnight at 1,012 pages. Technically, though, it's four short novels, but they're not published separately, so technically it's one book. It's a mammoth, Four Past Midnight. Um, it was fair. The Langoliers is probably the best one which, as I recall, was about a... made into a movie as well. It was about a, a flight on which all the passengers suddenly disappear. I can remember the way they left behind their clothes and, like, the fillings out of their teeth were just lying, <laughs> lying there because that's not a part of your body, you know, on the plane. That was kind of funny. can't remember much else about it than that. But, yeah, I remember liking it. And this, the uh, Secret Window, Secret Garden was memorable and it was made into a movie with Johnny Depp called Secret Window, which is a pretty good movie. Yeah, and then there was The Sun Dog and The Library Policeman. I'm surprised I'm even remembering these, but yeah, they weren't so good. It's okay though. So now we get to the, the novel that I read this month. Clocking in at 929 pages, it is Swan Song by Robert R. McCammon. Now, I have read Robert R. McCammon in the past. My first, my first read of him was a short story collection called Blue World, way back when it came out in the late 1980s. remember really liking it. It was like right up there with Night Shift and Skeleton Crew by Stephen King, those collections. Really enjoyable stories, although 200-odd uh, pages at the back of it is made up by a short novel, uh, which was about a priest and a stripper, if I remember correctly. But I remember it being really good. Um, yeah, wasn't, I don't think it was a supernatural novel, but it was a good novel. And it wasn't a prurient novel, don't get me wrong. It was a good novel. Uh, but these are mostly horror stories in Blue World. Anyway, we're not talking about Blue World. Uh, I did read Boy's Life, which is the one he's possibly most known for, aside from possibly Swan Song. 
Uh, Boy's Life is not a horror novel. I don't know how to classify it. Uh, people love it. I didn't quite so much. It has stuck in my head. But again, it's... I have problems with magical things in stories that are borderline fairy taleish in in the way they're put in. The thing that I remember from Boy's Life was this. There's a scene where someone playing baseball hits the ball and hits it directly up into the air and it doesn't come back down again. And it's hinting at whoa, it's like wow, where did it go? He like hit it into orbit, you know? Well, that's not possible, yeah? You know, what goes up must come down. That's just reality, right? And if you want to write something and you said the ball never came back down, uh, you're taking me out of reality in a way that's just silly. As a writer, right? The writer is taking me out of reality in a way that's just silly and that doesn't work for me. And things like that in boy's life kind of spoiled it for me. Because it was about the magic of childhood, but you kind of have to connect it to reality if you want this to work for an adult reader, right? So Boy's Life, yeah, I have my reservations. Although I could see myself rereading it again someday. See, I, I went through a personal journey in life where I had, you know, we all experience a magical sense of reality as children, right? And then it gets sucked out of us in adulthood where the stories we were told as kids don't hold up like the stories about Santa Claus and about God even right they don't hold up although some people preserve those ideas but I rediscovered the magic uh, in adulthood in a way that was authentic and real and that is what I have tried to write about in my book which I called I Universe. Subtitled, very carefully subtitled, Demolishing and Rebuilding Spirituality for a Scientific Age. Because we live in a materialist scientific age that definitely does suck the magic out of reality. But the magic is there nevertheless. You just have to you just have to spot it again and it's there. And I explore it in that book. And I came to life in a way again, age 37, I sort of came to life. We're going off on a real tangent now. But, you know, and I have rode the crest of that wave ever since. And it's largely what my YouTube channel has been about. Um, but, anyway, yeah, that is a plug for my book, by the way. So, <laughs> check it out. Um, or avail yourself of the audiobook by becoming a one dollar patron, right? If you like, no pressure. Uh, anyway, magic in books, when it's done in that kind of fairy tale-ish way, it works for kids, it does not work for adults. So if you're writing for adults, don't do that. That'd be my advice, right? But he did it in Boy's Life. Did he do it in Swan Song? A little. Um, It's about nuclear war, right? And I, I love that theme in books, especially if it's like from the 80s when I grew up living with Cold War tensions in my brain all the time, wondering when the bomb was going to fall and a big mushroom cloud would appear in the distance. You know, we all thought like that. But it's, it is interesting to revisit the fiction written in the 80s about the 80s Cold War tensions, but this is not have a book about those tensions. At the start of the book, it's normal life. We're introduced to a bunch of characters and then uh, it all hits the fan and the missiles fly between Russia and the United States and it's the end of the world, really. Uh, and we don't get to, you know, our, the characters in this book aren't looking at the bombs from afar. They are it, almost at ground zero, you know, they're just lucky enough in that they managed to be in some circumstances or other underground when the bombs fell. But then they had to like crawl out into the radioactive wasteland, you know. So this is a harrowing novel in the same way that The Road was a harrowing novel by Cormac McCarthy. But 
this one does contain more of a sense of hope, more of a sense that it's going somewhere. And there are unfortunately some, for unfortunately or fortunately, some magical elements. I kind of just went with them this way and they didn't bother me so much the way they bothered me in Boy's Life because Boy's, Boy's Life was not a fantasy novel, whereas this, just from the get-go, has fantasy elements. The book is called Swan Song because there's a little girl called Swan. Her real name is Sue Wanda, but her mom calls her Swan as a kind of joining of those two names. And she has some kind of strange ability to make things grow. She can make plants, you know, where there's really arid ground, she can make plants grow. And she just loves her own little garden and everything. But of course, all that is taken away from her in the nuclear blast. But uh, we have other characters, really interesting, strange ones. Uh, there's a guy called Josh who's a big, massive, burly wrestler. He's a black dude and he has, he's, he's been coined with the name Black Frankenstein because he's so tall. Uh, but he's, you know, he's kind of let himself go and he's flabby. Uh, but that's all about to change because he survives the blast and he becomes one of the principal characters of this book. Another one is a homeless woman who's crazy and is a religious nut who has been coined, she can't remember her own name, so he's, she has been coined by other people with the name Sister Creep. So <laughs> she's one of the main characters in this. Uh, Unlike The Stand, and this has been compared to The Stand, this book, but unlike The Stand, uh, it does not have a, a Christ, Christianity isn't in the background of this book. And I did a little research on Robert McCammon before choosing to read this book, because I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to be wasting my time investing, investigating 900 pages. Uh, but Robert McCammon, it says, is a practicing Christian, which is like, huh? You know, so, but the book is far less Christian than The Stand is. Uh, and Robert McCallum certainly has no qualms about saying the, having his characters say the J word, you know. Um, so he does definitely belong in the ranks of those horror writers who don't pull their punches. He's prepared to go, you know, there's nothing tasteless in the book, but he definitely is prepared to make it horrific. Um, so don't be expecting a tame book just because it says Robert McCammon is a Christian. Maybe he wasn't back then, I don't know, maybe that was something that came later. Something else about him that really impressed me and actually sort of helped coax me to read this book was I discovered that uh, Robert McCallum, okay, he brought, he brought Blue World and Boy's Life and then there was one called Gone South came out which uh, I read as well, but I only read it as an abridged audiobook, so I kind of think that doesn't count. But it was okay, from what I remember. But after that, and that was the early 1990s, after that, he disappeared from publishing entirely. And uh, for 10 years. And he, say, he said in an interview that uh, he had written a piece of historical fiction, it's now published uh, as a book, the Matthew Corbett books. Uh, he'd written one of these, and... The publisher had demanded all kinds of changes. I think I'm getting this right. And rather than give in to this and have his novel sort of revised in ways that he wasn't happy with, uh, he just said, right, that's it, we're done. And he just disappeared and, and stopped writing and publishing. I don't know if he stopped writing, but he certainly stopped publishing for 10 years. And you know, integrity like that is really impressive to me. I don't know that I would have the same integrity if faced with that choice. You know, publisher tries to play a hardball with you and says, well, if you don't make these changes, we're not publishing the book. And yet the, publisher, the publishers depend on these writers, you know. Um, but he just said, right, that's it. And he faced the same thing with Boy's Life, apparently. Um, they basically said, okay... We want you to take out everything except the stuff about the murders. Just concentrate on the murder that happens in this book. And he said, listen, I'm coming. I'm jumping on a plane here. We need to talk. <laughs> he jumped on a plane and went to his publisher. and Because he thought the publisher was going to love it. He thought the publisher was going to publisher was gonna say, oh, this is amazing. We didn't, think we, we didn't think you had this in you. But that's not what happened. 
But he managed to bring them around in, in that instance. And they said, okay, we'll publish it as is, but on your head be it. And lo and behold, even though that's not, I'm not a big fan of the book, it became practically his most successful book. It's a toss-up between Swan Song and Boy's Life, really. Um, Swan Song was also listed in a list, a, a pretty prominent list of 100 best American novels. Right? So that's a pretty big accolade to get. I'm not sure, I forget who put the list together, but I think it's a pretty significant list it's on. 100 American novels. Uh, anyway, I've digressed a lot. <laughs> 25 minutes in. Are you still listening to this? My goodness. Anyway, I do tend to go on. But let's crack on here. A little bit about Swan Song. Non-spoilery. Um, so there's the girl with that semi-magical ability. There's also an artifact, a kind of an artifact with magical properties that turns up early in the story. And, well, I'm asking, well, where did that come from? Who put it there? Why is it there? Why does it do what it does? And you don't get any answers to any of those questions. It's just there in the book. Yeah, it's not the way I would have gone if I was constructing this story, but... I kind of went with it, and if you're if you're a fan of fantasy stories that contain magic of this of this sort, uh, you won't mind it. So anyway, it's a bit like the stand. As I said, there is a mean bad guy, there's, uh, there's the equivalent of Randall Flagg from Stephen King's book, and he's not in the story a great deal. Uh, yeah. What to say about him without spoiling? I'll just I'll just leave that abstract. You'll meet him when you read the book. Basically, the bad guy. He is supernatural in nature, uh, but he's not the only sort of antagonist. Uh, the book is split into two halves: book one and book two. Book one is really the immediate aftermath of the nuclear blast, uh, the first couple of months, say. Book two takes place seven years later where people have organized themselves into communities and it has much more of a Mad Max vibe which I really liked actually uh, you know if you think of Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior which was after a nuclear war but it was years after a nuclear war and everything was an arid desert uh, but you had all these fancy sort of armored trucks and cars and everything and people who looked weird uh, bad guys who had banded together and their way of life was to scavenge from more progressive forward thinking communities who were trying to grow things and whatnot. Uh, but of course nothing grows, what am I thinking of, right? Hold that thought, right? <laughs> but you know, so it's kind of like it's kind of like Mad Max except you got to rewind and it takes place within the nuclear winter so everything's dark and there's, you never see the stars, you never see the sun it's constant cloud cover, snowing all the time uh, really bad weather, always cold uh, and everybody's sick and deformed and stuff, and stuff. Uh, so uh, yeah it's pretty harrowing but you've got that sort of Mad Max vibe going on with the vehicles and the, the sort of motivation of the scavenging community. Uh, there was nothing boring about this book. It cracks on at a really good pace. Even though a lot of it, a lot of the book is really just about traveling and from one place to the next, it definitely does not have the typical three act structure of a story. Uh, it's more like a big saga. I sort of imagined it, and I imagined each chapter like an episode of a TV series that I would be watching and you would you know watch one a day typically. I don't do the binge watch thing. Um, well I was reading more than one chapter a day typically because I got through this in about 22 days I think. Uh, yeah. So chapters are a good size for like sitting down for a half hour reading time or something like that. Uh, and the pace, you know, it never bored me. The book, ne there was a, maybe a couple of places where I thought, is something actually, are we going to get somewhere with this story? But every chapter gave me something, kept me motivated to read further on. I really liked it. And 
the danger with large books, and it sometimes happened, and happened most recently with me with Duma Key, is that when I hit the last 150 pages or so, I could kind of see where it was going and I just wanted to get it done. Not so with Swan Song. Things got really exciting and high octane in the last 150 odd pages of the book, and it was really good. Yeah, and very satisfying at the end. Suffers from those magical elements. Suffers also from a bit of melodrama, which I don't like in books. Uh, Kuntz does it a lot, and I, I find Kuntz very hard to read now. McCammon, not so much. Uh, but if you've read King and Kuntz and you've liked them, you'll definitely like Robert McCammon. Well worth reading. I got this version of mine. It came up recently on a, on a Kindle sale. I got it for £2, which was fantastic. Uh, so yeah, check out Swan Song. So that is my March of the Mammoths. Alright folks, till next time, take care. The sky.